Hello, welcome to this open day talk. My name is Dr. Bethan Davis, and I'm going to be giving a short lecture on ice in a changing world and in Antarctica. This is the Antarctic ice sheet. You can see that it is a continent surrounded by ocean. It's at the South Pole. Unlike the Arctic, which is an ocean surrounded by ice, this is a continent of land surrounded by ocean. There are actually three ice sheets in Antarctica. There is the larger East Antarctic ice sheet, the smaller West Antarctic ice sheet, and the Antarctic Peninsula ice sheet, which is the spine of mountains that projects north towards Patagonia. If you went to Antarctica and stood on the surface of the ice and dome sea, you would be a couple of kilometres above sea level. You'd be around two to 3,000 metres high. This is the highest, the driest, and the windiest continent on Earth. And yet, if you went and stood on the surface of the ice in East Antarctica, all you would be able to see in every direction is the great flat white. It is a flat ice sheet completely overwhelms the topography beneath it. There is no, no life here. Nothing lives on the surface of the Antarctic ice sheet. Not in the centre here where the ice is so very thick. Antarctica is surrounded by floating ice shelves. These ice shelves uh, surround 75% of Antarctica's coastline and they receive 20% of Antarctica's snowfall. Ice shelves are the floating extensions of the ice sheet. When the ice sheet meets the ocean, it starts to thin and to float. And so you have these extensive floating ice shelves that surround Antarctica. This is where most of the melt happens in Antarctica. Most of the ice melts or is carved as icebergs from the ends of these ice shelves. You can see here the grounding line. The grounding line is the point at which the ice sheet starts to float. Antarctica is surrounded by sea ice. Sea ice is frozen seawater. It's salty and briny and I would not recommend putting it in your ice, an ice cube in it in your Diet Coke. But sea ice is where all the animals live. These are some Adelie penguins here hopping about on the sea ice. And here is one of the predators of Antarctica. This is a leopard seal. Leopard seals like to eat Adelie penguins. And they hunt from the sea ice. The sea is very productive. There is a lot of krill. And it is where all the wildlife is, around the margins of Antarctica. If you took the ice sheet away, this is what you would see underneath the Antarctic ice sheet. It is a land of mountains and deep, deep valleys. And what you can see from this map, the base of Antarctica, is that large parts of the Antarctic ice sheet have a bed below sea level. You can see here the greens and the browns, that's land above sea level. And everywhere where it's blue, that is the land below sea level. So parts of West Antarctica have a bed two to 3,000 metres below sea level. This means that the West Antarctic ice sheet is what we would call a marine ice sheet. And seawater is able to reach the grounding line. And it's here that we're seeing a lot of the changes in Antarctica today. All around the Amazon Sea, which is this area where it says areas that are losing mass. We are getting glaciers and ice sheets thinning. You can see the black line around the margin of Antarctica. That is the grounding line. Everywhere beyond that, the ice is a floating ice shelf. And you can see that these ice shelves in the Amazon Sea sector, these are thinning. And so we're getting a lot of discharge of ice, not only at the ice shelf, but penetrating deep into the mainland. Other parts of ice shelves around East Antarctica are coloured blue. They're more stable and we're not seeing so much change there. But all around that Pacific seaboard, 
glaciers are thinning and receding, ice shelves are thinning and receding, and we're getting increased discharge of ice into the ocean. The biggest changes are two glaciers, Pine Island Glacier and Thwaites Glacier. These are the two biggest, fastest flowing, most important ice streams in Antarctica. Thwaites Glacier has an annual velocity of around 3,000 metres per year. If you put a rock on the ice surface, it would move around three kilometres in just one year. If you look in the, the figure here, figure E, you can see all these different circles. And these are, so these are volumes of ice that pass through the grounding line, ice that is melted or carved as icebergs. And you can see the change in volume. This is the change in volume over time. If the circle is blue, there is an in a decrease in ice volume over time. And if the circle is red, there is an increase in ice discharge through the grounding line. And you can see that it is again Pine Island Glacier and Thwaites Glacier that have the biggest increases in ice discharge. This figure, to, or figure F is from the difference in mass balance between 2017 and 1979. Again, if there are blue circles, there is an increase in ice volume and the glaciers have grown. And if there is a red circle, then that particular drainage basin has gotten smaller. Yeah, the ice has thinned, more ice has been carved, and there is a net loss of ice to the ocean. And again, it is Pine Island Glacier and Thwaites Glacier where we're seeing the biggest changes. What is happening here is that changes in oceanic currents mean that warm water is able to reach the grounding line. Circumpolar deep water, which is the red arrows here called CDW, is increasingly able to flow onto that continental shelf and reach the bed of these important glaciers. And it is here that it is melting the ice from below. So although it is very cold in Antarctica, and we see very little surface melt in West Antarctica on the surface of the ice, these warm ocean currents are driving very rapid change at the base of that weak underbelly of Pine Island Glacier and Thwaites Glacier. We can look at the change in mass balance through time. This graph has the mass change on the left and sea level contribution on the right and time along the bottom. And we have our three ice sheets. We have the East Antarctic ice sheet, which has not changed very much. And then we have the West Antarctic ice sheet in green. And you can see that the West Antarctic ice sheet has lost mass from 1990 to 2020 with around seven millimetres sea level rise from West Antarctica alone. From 1992 to 2017, the East Antarctic ice sheet was more or less in equilibrium. The West Antarctic ice sheet lost 94 billion tonnes of ice every year from 1992 to 2017. And that discharge has increased if we look at just from 2012 to 2017, the Antarctic ice sheet as a whole lost 219 billion tonnes of ice every year. That is around two thirds of a millimetre sea level rise from the Antarctic ice sheet every year. And that change is accelerating. I'm going to hand over now to Klaus Dodds, who's going to talk about some of the human dimensions of climate change and human dimensions of research in Antarctica. Thank you. Hello there. It's a great pleasure to give you an overview of how Antarctica is governed. Uh, this is the remotest, coldest, highest, windiest continent in the world, and it's quite unique because it doesn't have an indigenous human population. So that raises the intriguing question, who actually owns Antarctica? 
if nobody lives there, permanently at least, then how have countries come to adjudicate on this issue of ownership? Well, since the 1940s, there have been seven claimant states. And you can see the, the map there. The seven are the United Kingdom, Norway, Australia, France, New Zealand, Argentina, and Chile. And straight away, a couple of things might strike you as noteworthy. First of all, Australia has an enormous claim to the Antarctic continent. Something like 42% of the continent is claimed as Australian Antarctic Territory. Secondly, the United Kingdom, Argentina and Chile have overlapping claims, so that makes it really rather awkward. And then finally, you probably know, can see that there is an unclaimed sector. This is the only part of the Earth's surface that is not claimed by one state or another. Now, whilst we have those seven claimant states, and these are really enormous pie-like slices, uh, the United Kingdom's British Antarctic Territory, for example, is three or four times larger than the United Kingdom. But nobody else recognises those claims, so for all the efforts that the so-called claimant states have made, including planting flags, establishing bases, the rest of the world says, actually, we don't accept your claims. And Russia and the United States have historically reserved a right to make a claim in the future. So this means Antarctica, in a geopolitical sense, is a very contested territory. Now, why would anyone wish to claim Antarctica if it is indeed remote, cold, windy, uh, and generally speaking, pretty inaccessible? Well, the answer really lies in the 18th and 19th centuries. So in the 18th century, there was already a thriving industry of sealing, and that was joined in the 19th century by the growth of whaling. And commercial whaling was a major uh, strategic industry because whale oil was key to providing heating and lighting in many communities, including the United Kingdom. So whales were hunted in a, really at an industrial level, and places like South Georgia became major processing centres for whaling. Now, Antarctica was first sighted in 1820, and the United States, Russia and the United Kingdom all claim that they saw Antarctica first. But what happened afterwards, of course, was that a whole group of nations, including, for example, Norway, Argentina and Chile, all became very active and eager to exploit Antarctica. And the other thing to bear in mind is that even the waters around Antarctica, particularly the Drake's Passage, were also heavily used uh, by shipping companies. Uh, so, for example, uh, you might have had copper that was mined in Chile, going, being transported to South Wales for steel production, and the Drake's Passage was used by ships to transport copper back and forth. In the 1920s onwards, however, Antarctica took on a, a rather more sinister uh, connotation. Those claimant states were becoming increasingly aware of others taking an interest in Antarctica. Some of that included the United States, but perhaps most infamously, in the late 1930s, Nazi Germany eventually launched its own expedition to Antarctica. And in 1937-38, uh, we saw, for example, uh, German swastikas being planted on the ice or being thrown out of the window of passing planes in an attempt to lay the foundation for an eventual German claim. In the 1940s, Britain sent a secret operation called Tabarin to try and dissuade Argentina and Chile from making their own claims to what was at the time called Falkland Islands Dependencies and is now known as British Antarctic Territory. And then there was an added complication that as the world descended into conflict through World War II, would even Antarctica be caught up in this global conflict? Well, thankfully, the answer was not really. 
in the sense that apart from German raiders sinking some Norwegian whaling ships, the Antarctic was spared the excesses of World War II. But instead, with the onset of the Cold War, Antarctica became a new area of interest to a resurgent United States. And in the late 1940s, the US Navy launched really very, very large expeditions designed to showcase America's capability to extend its projection of power all over the world. So there was a little uh, a base called Little America established on the Ross Ice Shield and later one at the South Pole that was deliberately designed to remind the rest of the world that America was a global power. Now all of this of course could have led to a great deal more tension during this Cold War era but thankfully the International Geophysical Year of 1957-58 helped to reinforce the idea that Antarctica ought to be a scene for international cooperation and scientific investigation. So we often talk about 1958-59 being the sort of year that made Antarctica. It really helped to transform the Antarctic into a globally uh, relevant scientific laboratory. And indeed, that desire to keep Antarctica peaceful, that desire to keep Antarctica a place of scientific cooperation, later led to the Antarctic Treaty of 1959. And so essentially 12 parties who had been involved in the International Geophysical Year Polar Programme came together in Washington in December 1959 and agreed on a remarkable treaty that they declared that the Antarctic should be a zone of peace and cooperation where science should overwhelmingly prevail. It also meant that as part of that undertaking, all the parties, including the Soviet Union and the United States, said that they would not mine in Antarctica, that they would not carry out military exercises in Antarctica, they would not nuclear test or dump nuclear material, and they also agreed that they would not establish intelligence or, or listening-based radio radar stations in Antarctica, because that would be seen as uh, complicit with militarisation. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that Antarctica was somehow frozen in time and space, if you excuse the pun. What happened after the 1950s was that actually a whole series of other activities became more important. So, for example, fishing and resource exploitation, including that shrimp-like creature you can see called krill, became more important. Russia, Poland uh, and other countries, uh, including Norway, became really important fishing nations in the Southern Ocean. Commercial whaling largely dropped off by the 1960s, but fishing, including krill, grew noticeably. Tourism developed in the 1960s onwards, and so before the pandemic, for example, 55,000 people visited Antarctica, the vast majority by ship. And then finally, of course, science did grow, but it grew in a way that took into account that more and more other nations were becoming fascinated and intrigued by Antarctica. Noticeably in the 1980s, India and China became members of the Antarctic Treaty System, as it was called. But do we all agree on how to govern Antarctica? Are there still disagreements and tensions in terms of how we manage this uninhabited continent? Well, the answer is yes, we certainly disagree rather than agree. In the 1980s and 1990s, it was arguably the tensest period for Antarctic geopolitics. On the one hand, we had environmental organisations like Greenpeace, lobbying the world to say that there should never ever be mining in Antarctica and that Japan in particular was singled out for criticism because of its continued scientific whaling. But on the other hand, the Antarctic Treaty parties, including China, India, the United States and of course later Russia, worked together to prevent the Antarctic Treaty from being dismantled. So in the 1990s, we had a noticeable turn towards environmental protection. 
and a commitment by all parties that mining should be banned and that there should be continued work to make sure that exploitation of fish in particular was sustainable. Finally, we need to acknowledge that Antarctica is being talked about in fundamentally different ways than it was in the 1950s. The big game changer is, of course, climate change. We now recognise that Antarctica and the Greenland ice sheet are tremendously important in terms of the future of the world. And so now it's commonplace to associate the polar regions with sea level rise and to talk about ice as vulnerable, whereas in the past we might have seen it as threatening to human activity. Climate change also helps explain why countries like China and India have become ever more interested in the Antarctic. One of the noticeable uh, things that you will see are maps uh, which purport to show the cities most affected by sea level rise. Shanghai is often cited as one of the most vulnerable. And of course, Shanghai would be absolutely on the front line for sea level rise that was directly uh, connected to the melting of the Antarctic ice sheet. So I hope that's given you a very quick whistle-stop tour of Antarctic geopolitics. There's a lot that we agree upon, but also uh, as the recent events surrounding marine protected areas remind us, we don't always agree on how to conserve Antarctica, even if we acknowledge that it matters to all of us. Thank you very much. <laughs>